Yes, yeah, so welcome to this session, which is probably the weirdest session at this year's IT DevCon. Uh, basically, everything started half a year ago when I had a sudden idea that it would be very nice to do a presentation on functional programming and Delphi and how one relates to another and so on. And I put a note down and forgot about it. And then when Daniela was asking what I can present, what topics I can cover, I remembered this small note and mm -hmm. I put together a proposal that said basically what I just said and something like the practical purpose for listeners will be that they will learn more about anonymous methods, they will see some practical examples of practical code and so on. And then I forgot about it again. <coughs> and in early October, I started putting together sessions, four of them, and three were relatively easy. And this one, the last one, well, uh, I finished it last Sunday, and I started it last Saturday. So <laughs> just put together over the last weekend before IT DevCon simply because I couldn't decide what to tell and how to package everything and in what form to put stuff so it will be understandable and so on. <clears throat> and what has happened at the end is something that could be compared to the LSD. It was designed to blow your mind and it will give you a bad aftertaste tomorrow when you, you, you will suddenly realize that you have no idea what I was talking about. And uh, so the idea behind this presentation is to give you some new ideas, <coughs> to give you some new topics, how you could maybe expand your Delphi programming toolbox, what can be done. I don't say that you have to do anything like this, but maybe after half a year, you will be a in, a in a situation when you will suddenly realize, oh yes, I could maybe solve this with anonymous function. And then you will go back and relearn how to use them and so on. So don't try to remember too much. Just remember what can be done and not how. Everything can be found on the internet. There are many great themes and so on. But the basic from my talk was functional programming, so I will spend a few minutes talking about this particular discipline. <coughs> the basic idea becoming behind functional programming is that a program is a function. You give some data in and something falls out. Output is a function of input. And in more theoretical and precise terms, the functional programming is based on something called lambda calculus, which is quite an old mathematical discipline. Okay, it's 1900 something, but it's not last year or 10 years ago. Uh, and the idea is to write functions that don't depend on state. Or in other words, they should not have any side effects. So you put some values in, and computation is based entirely on those values. No global state, no nothing. Of course, in practical implementations, we immediately run into problems <coughs> because input is something that is a side effect and output is something that is a side effect and database success is something that is a side effect and so on and so on. So in practical implementations, all functional programming languages broke this uh, restriction in one way or another in some controlled manner. So you have most of the program which is purely fun functional and then there's some stuff with side effects. And uh, if you want some examples of functional languages, Haskell is very well known. I will show some examples from this language. Erlang could be considered a functional language it's a language which was designed for <coughs> multi-processing in mind and is used, for example, in Siemens switching state, telephone switching boxes. Uh, Scala is a variation of Lisp. 
which is functional. And what they all have <coughs> in common is that because of this, and this, and this, they're trivial to parallelize. Because there are no side, side effects, no shared functions, no nothing. You can just throw the code as, on as many CPUs as you want, and it will all work. Uh, well, F sharp, for example, is a functional language based on C sharp. Uh, implemented by Microsoft, fully supported, it will be fully included in the next Visual Studio, I believe. Even. <coughs> so, two areas where uh, functional languages are really strong. One is massive parallelization, and I don't think four cores, but massive. And the other is uh, various financial calculations, banking, and so on. Because if you don't have side effects, you can mathematically prove that your code is correct. Or at least it's much easier to prove mathematically that your code is correct. <coughs> so we call the normal programming imperative programming. And if I say iterative instead of imperative sometimes, this is purely my lapsus. Uh, I have a confusion somewhere in my brain between those two words and functional programming. Uh, these are four building blocks of functional languages. They all build on those principles. Variables can never be changed. Once you assign something to a variable, it cannot be modified. End of story. Because modifying a variable is side effect. Uh, then they typically depend on pattern matching to find the path to the program. And I will show an example of this later. Uh, and they very, very, very much depend on high order functions. And this is actually a mathematical term. <coughs> high order function is function which returns as a result, not a value, but another function. And that's something that's extremely important in uh, functional programming style. And the last one is recursion, because you cannot modify a variable, you cannot have a loop counter. <coughs> so how do you implement a loop with recursion? Function will call itself again and again and again and again. And because of that, all functional programming language implementations are specifically tailored so they can execute recursive functions especially tail recursive, that is, the last statement in a function is a callback to the same function uh, extremely well and fast and without using any additional stack space. The question is, what of this is of any use in Delphi? So, immutable variables hard. You can do, for example, a record which could be initialized only once or you can implement a class which doesn't allow modification or something like this. But those are all hacks. And uh, <coughs> in my belief, Delphi is imperative language. And we should keep most of the Delphi and use it, but just take a few ideas somewhere. So scratch this. Pattern matching, it can be implemented as a set of if or case statements which say if, if this parameter it was, is of this form, call this path, otherwise call the other functions, so trivial. Higher order functions, these are implemented, can be implemented with anonymous functions, and they will make a very strong point in today's talk. And recursion, this is plain old Pascal, when we uh, this made out Pascal from scratch, he put in uh, the ability to call functions recursively. So it's in the language since 1980-something, when it was built. So as the other things are more or less known and trivial, I will not put much talk into them. But anonymous methods are something that's with us as Delphi programmers for quite a long time now. 
from Delphi 2009. And lots of people don't use them because they don't have any idea how they could be used. I know for myself that I needed two years of programming in new tools because bef before I slowly realized what can and what is useful to be implemented with anonymous functions and where they're helpful and where they're not. And uh, anonymous function is basically a function without a name. Very simple. It is compiled as a function. It lives in a compiled code as compiled code. But you cannot really call it by name because it doesn't have a name. <coughs> it is implemented as an interface. So whenever you see an anonymous function, you can safely store it into T interface list or into variant variable or into something that is of I interface type, that is common interface or whatever. Or you can cast it to native int if you are brave and foolish. <coughs> this I copied from the Delphi doc wiki. Uh, shortcut. Go to Google, type in dots wiki space Delphi. And it, this will be the first hit. And then, you and then you type in anonymous methods and it will bring you to, the, to this topic. Uh, saying whatever we want about Delphi documentation, which is very lacking in places, this topic is extremely well covered. And here you will learn almost everything you have to learn about anonymous functions or to refresh your knowledge. Great. Okay, that's for introduction. I'm running this on XC, but everything would equally well work on XC2 and should equally well work on 2010 and 2009. I'm saying should because there were some bug fixes in Delphi compiler from 2009 to XC related to anonymous functions. But the basic operations and everything uh, not overly complicated should work fine. As I said, <coughs> anonymous function and high order functions. I will put these, those two together now. I have here a function called multiply, which is not a normal function, but it returns some weird <coughs> object, which is here specified in generic notation. Let's look what this t func is. Let me maximize this. This is in CCTILS definition comes with Delphi and says tfunc of parameter and parameter and result is a reference to function which accepts one parameter of type t1 and second parameter of type t2 and returns t result. This reference to function is how you declare an anonymous function if you have to, if you're not just using it somewhere in the code. And it exactly specifies what anonymous function really is. It is an interface pointing to a function, a reference to a function. But usually, you should use uh, those t func and sorry, there are also t proc declarations, which are reference to procedure. It is a code that does not return a result. And there's also t predicate because predicate is. Uh, term in uh, functional programming for function taking one argument and returning true or false. <coughs> and as I said, <coughs> usually when declaring parameter or result, which is an anonymous function, you should use tproc or tfunc uh, wrapper. So this one says, I'm returning a function which will accept one integer and another integer and <coughs> return one integer. And to declare it, I said, is not to declare to 
write the code. Result is what? Anonymous function. So how do we write it? Simply we say function without a name, taking two parameters of type integer and returning integer. And then comes a weird part, and here is no semicolon. I really don't know why, but Barry Kelly would probably be able to explain this. <coughs> then I say begin end. And again, there's in reality no semicolon here. In if I am looking only at a declaration of an anonymous method, but I have to put one to end the result becomes something, semicolon statement. <coughs> and I will say a result, and now this is result of this anonymous function, not result of the multiply function becomes A times B. Oops, sorry. So again, <coughs> we have a function that is returning anonymous function. And this function has a result, a declaration of a function. Uh, all the code will also be available. And this inner function, which is returned, takes two parameters and calculates a result by multiplying. This is something that compiler can trivially compile. <coughs> Just a normal multiply function without a name. So when I call this, <coughs> I have two options. I can call multiply and I have to pass empty parameter list. Otherwise, the compiler complains that it cannot parse my code. So this is required uh, <coughs> and I can store this into an internal variable which is again of the same type as multiplies returning and then I can use this internal variable to execute the anonymous function for real so this will basically, what happens? The compiler will compile this anonymous function during the compilation phase. Oh, where are we? This one, the internal one, and the external one. And when I call multiply, all it will do will get this address of anonymous function and give it to me. And I can use this address to calculate now multiplication of two and three. Or I can call my high order function that is multiply and use the result directly with the parameters two and three. And just to prove that I'm not uh, making this up. Get six. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> uh, so what happens here? One more time, because I know this is hard to follow. I will put breakpoints in more important places. Then I call. Okay, we are here. Multiply function will be called. Okay. And result will just be something will be put in result, but nothing here is executed in reality. And we come to the second part and now <coughs> this variable is used to call the function and we are in the function. And the second time because I did this twice. So try to explain this one more time and then I hope that I got the basics across. So when you're executing a single statement, like A becomes two times three, compiler generates a code that uh, multiplies two times three, actually doesn't because it's smart enough to know that this is six, but it doesn't matter. And then this uh, generates a code which puts this into a variable. When you are doing this first version, Compiled code already contains this anonymous function somewhere. And when you say mul becomes multiply of nothing, it will just store the address 
of this function into the variable. And then when you execute this anonymous function, it will use this address to calculate it, those parameters and store the output into the 